the hot Jaya Istanbul, 1980s a week later Perry mustered the courage to reveal her secret to her father you are seeing things, did you say? Menser asked, with a newspaper crossword folded on his lap not things, Baba. Just one thing, Perry said. An infant where is this infant exactly? Perry blushed. In the air, sort of floating for a moment, his expression gave nothing away. You are my clever daughter, he said finally. Do you want to turn into your mother? If so, go ahead, fill your head with foolishness. I'd have expected better of you her heart sank. Determined never to disappoint him, she yielded. I wasn't he that hard. After all, she had not touched the apparition, and, even though she had seen it, and later on she would also hear it, she could not rust her senses, given the oddness of the experience. By her father's rule of thumb, the baby in the mist did not exist. It was all inside her head, she concluded, but as to why it was inside her head, she could think of no plausible explanation the civilized world, Parasim, was not built on unfounded beliefs. It was built on science, reason, and technology. You and I belong in that world I know, Baba Good. Drop this subject. And do not, ever, mention it to your mother it was inevitable, though. If her father's physics had its universal rules, so did human psychology. The moment one was told not to enter the fortieth door or not to peek into a chest, that door was bound to be unlatched, that chest had to be prized open. To be fair, for as long as she could, Perry kept their promise, but the next time the baby in the mist appeared, she went running to her mother for help. Why didn't you tell me before? Selma said, her forehead creased with concern. Perry swallowed hard. I told dad your father? What does he know? Selma said. Listen, this sounds like doing of a genie. Some are well behaved, others pure evil. The Quran warns us against the danger. They'd do anything to possess a human being especially a girl. Women are especially vulnerable to their attacks, they must be careful Selma leaned forward and moved a lock of her daughter's hair behind her ear. The gesture, simple and affectionate, set off a rush of tenderness inside Perry. She asked, what should I do? Two things. First of all, always tell me the truth. Allah sees through every lie. And parents are the eyes of Allah on earth. Secondly, we must find an exorcist the next morning the two of them went to see a hot jaw famous for his powers to cleanse one of demonic possession. A portly man with a tiny dark mustache and a wheezy voice. In his hand he held an onyx rosary which he thumbed slowly. His white head was out of proportion to the rest of his body, as if it had been planted in haste, an afterthought, and his shirt had been buttoned all the way up, so tightly that it had swallowed his neck. Gazing at Perry searchingly, he asked questions about her eating, playing studying, sleeping and toilet habits. Under his scrutiny, an uneasiness came over the child, but she stayed put in her chair, doing her best to reply in earnest. He asked her if she had recently killed a spider or a caterpillar or a lizard or a cockroach or a grasshopper or a ladybird or a wasp or an ant. This last one made Perry hesitate, who knew, maybe she had stepped on an ant, or, worse yet, an anthill. The hot jaw confirmed that the jinn, elusive as they were, could take the form of insects, and if one crushed them without uttering the name of Allah, one would be possessed there and then. Thus saying, the hot jaw turned to Selma. Had the child learned not to go out without reciting the Fatiha asterisk this wouldn't have happened. I've got five kids, none of them were ever bothered by jinn. Why? Simple, because they know how to protect themselves. Did you not teach her anything, sister? Selma's gaze darted from the man to her daughter and back. I try, but she doesn't listen. Her father is a bad influence it's nothing to do with him, protested Perry. Then, quietly, what happens now? In lieu of an answer, the exorcist held the child by the shoulders, leaned in close to her face for what felt like eternity and hissed, whatever your name, I'll find it out. Then you'll be my slave. I know you are one of Tenholi. 
You spiteful, wicked thing. Abandon this innocent girl. I warn you. Harry squeezed her eyes shut. The man's fingers loosened around her shoulders. He sprinkled rose water on her head, reciting prayers to ward off the evil. He asked her to swallow tiny papers with Arabic letters on them the ink dyeing her tongue a blue so bright that it would last for days. Nothing happened. That night, upon the hot jaw's instructions and her mother's insistence, Perry spent an hour alone in the garden, flinching at every little sound, a silhouette of fear in the faint light of a street lamp. The next morning they sent her to chase a pack of stray dogs. The dogs chased her instead. Oh, Jenny, I give you one last chance, said the exorcist when they went to see him a second time. In his hand he held a long stick made from a dead willow branch. Either you come out willingly, or I'll give you a severe beating before Perry could grasp what she had heard, the man hit her on her back. The child screamed. Selma paled. Is this necessary, F and Dim? This is the only cure. The genie needs to be scared. The longer it stays in here body, the more powerful it gets yes, but. I can't allow this, said Selma, her lips drawn into a thin line we must leave your choice, said the hot jaw flatly. Let me warn you, sister. This child is prone to darkness. Even if you get rid of this genie now, she can be taken captive by another, easy as breathing. Keep an eye on her mother and daughter, more scared by the exorcist than by any conceivable genie, exited the house in a hurry, though not before Selma made a hefty payment. Don't worry, I'm going to be fine, said Perry, when they reached the bus stop. She held her mother's hand, feeling guilty. Mother, what did he mean when he said I was prone to darkness? Selma looked unsettled not so much by her daughter's question as by her own inability to provide an answer. Some people just are, by birth. That explains, I guess, the things you did when you were little she stopped herself, her eyes tearing up. Not knowing what her mother meant, Perry feared that she must have done something very, very wrong. I'll be good. I promise yet another promise she would do her utmost to keep from that day forth. Obediently, she would adhere to what was expected of her, tracing her steps back to where she had veered away from the routine, ever so careful not to cause surprises, no shocking incidents. She would be as unremarkable and unthreatening as she possibly could be. Selma planted a kiss on her forehead. Kanim asterisk let's hope this thing ice over, but beware. It might return. And if it does, you must tell me. The Janair vengeful it did return, but, having learned her lesson the hard way, Perry mentioned it to no one. Her mother was too superstitious and her father too rational for either of them to be of any help to her in so surreal a matter. Anything remotely uncanny, even if only slightly out of the ordinary, Selma would attribute to a religious cause, and Menser, to downright insanity. Perry, for her part, preferred to commit to neither. The more Perry considered her options, the more she was convinced that she had to keep her visions to herself. Deeply unsettling though they were she accepted them as a peculiarity of life, like an eye floater, something that didn't go away and only bothered her when she was aware of it, leaving her no choice but to learn to live with it. Thus the baby in the mist, whether a jinny or something else altogether, was stowed away in the recesses of her mind, a riddle unresolved. Years later, not long before she left for Oxford, she would write down in here God diary, is there really no other way, no other space for things that fall under neither belief nor disbelief, neither pure religion nor pure reason? A third path for people such as me? For those of us who find dualities too rigid and don't wish to conform to them? Because there must be others who feel as I do. It is as if I'm searching for a new language. An elusive language spoken by no one but me. The fish tank Istanbul, 2016 it was quarter to nine in the evening when mother and daughter reached these aside Konak. Wrought iron balconies, white marble steps, mosaic fountains, high-tech security cameras, electric gates, barbed wire fencing. The estate resembled less a house than an island, a palatial citadel that had locked itself out of the city, if not the other way round. 
every security measure had been taken to ensure that no hawkers, no burglars, no criminals and no unwelcome lifestyles crossed its threshold. Perry kept her injured right hand close to her chest, holding the steering wheel with her left. On the way they had stopped by a chemist's and had the pharmacist, a middle-aged man with a grizzled mustache, attend to Thagish. When he inquired how this had come about, Perry had said briskly, chopping vegetables. This is what happens when you cook in a hurry he had left. The pharmacists of Istanbul were a wise breed. They would neither let a lie go undetected nor pursue uncomfortable truths. Prostitutes with injuries caused by customers, pimps or self-mutilation, women battered by their husbands, drivers thumped by other drivers, they could all walk into chemists' shops and blurt out their lies, safe in the knowledge that even if they were not believed, at least they would not be quest ioned. Perry checked the bandage, grimacing as she saw the crimson stain that had seeped through the gauze. She would have preferred to take it off before entering the party to avoid difficult questions, but the pain, the blood and the risk of infection were enough to change her mind. As soon as they stopped at the gate, a burly security guard in a dark suit and a cloud of aftershave appeared. While he parked the car, Perry and Denise passed through the manicured garden with vine-covered trellises. A gentle wind ruffled the leaves of the plane trees. Darling, I shouldn't have chased that man. What was I thinking, said Perry, breaking the silence. With her good hand she touched her daughter ever so lightly, as though the girl were fragile, her anger made of glass. They used to be so close, in the past they'd had their own codes. It was hard to believe now that this was the same girl who used to shake with laughter at her silly jokes and hold her hand when a Disney character shed tears. That sweet child had disappeared, leaving this stranger in her place. The transformation, for she had no other word, had caught Perry unprepared even though she had read scores of articles on how puberty came earlier and darlier, especially for girls. She had always been determined to have a far better relationship with her daughter than the one she'd had with her mother. In the end, wasn't that the only real aspiration to be fulfilled in life to do a better job than our parents, so our children might be better parents than we were? But what we often discover instead is how we unwittingly repeat the same mistakes as the previous generation. Perry also knew that anger all too often masked fear. She said softly, I'm sorry if I scared you mum, you did scare me, said Denise. You could have been killed. Her daughter was right. Back in that alley she could have lost her life tough tramp. But what Denise did not know was that the opposite was just as true, if not more so, she could have killed the tramp. I'll never do such a thing again, Perry said, as they reached the stairs tough house promise. Promise, sweetheart. Just don't say anything to your father, it'll make him worry. Denise paused, an instant of hesitation that disappeared as quickly as it had come. She shook her head. He has a right to know Perry was about to say something in return but the huge oak door, carved with flowers and foliage, opened from inside. A maid in a black skirt and white chiffon blouse stood at the entrance, smiling. From behind her rose the sounds and smells of a dinner party in full swing welcome, Come on in, please the maid spoke with a striking accent, probably Moldavian or Georgian or Ukrainian, one of the many foreign women who worked in Istanbul households, while back home their children were raised by relatives and friends, and their spouses waited for monthly payments to arrive why did you bring me here? Denise hissed loudly. I told you, your friend's going to be here. Come on. Let's enjoy the venting. No sooner had they taken a step inside than Perry saw her husband pushing through the guests towards them, his expression a mixture of apprehension and irritation. Slim cut nut brown jacket, crisp white shirt, blue and fawn tie, shoes polished to the luster of glass, Adnan had taken care with his appearance. A self made man, he had worked his way up from humble beginnings to accumulated wealth through property development. He often said he owed his success to no one but Allah the Almighty. Perry, much as she respected her husband's hard work and business acumen, wasn't clear why the Creator would have favored him over others. Adnan was 17 years older than Perry, but it seemed to her that the age difference became most apparent whenever he was upset and the lines in his forehead deepened, as they did now. Where have you been? 
I called you 50 times. I'm sorry, darling, I lost my phone, Perry said, in the most soothing voice she could muster. Long story, let's not talk about it now you know why we're late, Dad. Denise said, her eyes lit up at seeing her father. Because Mum was busy chasing thieves? What? Denise pushed a strand of hair out of her eyes. She had her father's nose long and slightly bulbous, and his confidence. Ask her, she said, before walking towards a girl her own age, who was looking bored among the older guests. But there was no time to explain. The owner of the mansion, having interrupted his conversation with a well known journalist, strode over to them. He was a broad shouldered, stockily built man with a bald head and thruddy complexion of a heavy drinker. Not a single wrinkle lined his face, every inch of which had absorbed the latest anti aging treatments. When he smiled, his features remained stock still, save for the merest twitch at the corners of his lips. You made it, the businessman boomed. His blue eyes, glittering with mischief, sized her up. What happened to your hand? Did someone try to kidnap you? It's your fault. You shouldn't be so beautiful. Perry smiled, even though the joke made her blanch. She hoped neither hen or anyone else would comment on the state of her dress, torn at the hem spattered with frappuccino. Mercifully, the stains of blood were disguised. As uneven brownish marks. She said, we had a little accident on the way here. Adnan's brow furrowed with concern. An accident. Nothing important, believe me, Perry said, as she touched her husband's elbow, a signal not to ask further. She turned to the businessman, amiably what a gorgeous house you have thank you, my dear. Unfortunately, we have enough reason to suspect we've e been struck with the evil eye. One calamity after another. First, our pipes burst. The ground floor was flooded to our ankles. Then lightning struck, a tree fell onto our roof, can you imagine? All in the course of these past few months you should have an Azar Bankyugu, asterisk Adnan suggested well, we have something even better. Tonight we've invited a psychic. Oh, really? Perry inquired, not because she was interested in the subject but because she knew she was expected to say something. She had a feeling that lately public interest in mediums and fortune tellers had rocketed. Perhaps it was no coincidence that in a country where instability was the norm, there was such a craze for prophecies and predictions, mostly expressed by women, though pertinent to both sexes. Amidst chronic political ambiguity and lack of transparency, the crystal gazers, whether fake or genuine, served a social function by shifting uncertainty into some semblance of certainty everyone says he's terrific, the businessman said. This guy doesn't just talk to the jinn. He commands them. Whatever he orders them to do, they obey, apparently. He has jinn wives, a full harem. He snorted on the last word, but, noticing Perry was not joining in, he fixed his eyes on her. What's wrong? You look like you've seen an apparition yourself Perry instinctively recoiled. There were times when she had wondered whether people could read her face and know she had visions, things they couldn't see. Fortunately, the businessman had no wish to listen to anything other than his own voice. I know brokers who consult this guy before buying stocks. Crazy, isn't it? Psychics and stock markets. He laughed my wife's idea. Don't blame her. Poor thing, she lost it a bit after the crash it had been all over the news. About six months ago, a dry cargo vessel 335 feet long and sailing under the flag of Sierra Leone, had run aground and straight into the waterfront residence. It had destroyed the seawall and the elaborate south-facing balcony, which dated back to the last century of the Ottoman Empire. It was on this balcony that Kaiser Wilhelm II had had tea with a Pashak known for the scale of his ambitions and his admiration for German culture and military prowess. That same Pasha had then spread rumors that the Kaiser was a Muslim, he having had the opening lines of the Quran whispered into his ear at birth, even before he was placed on his mother's breast, his real name was Haji Wilhelm, lifelong friend and adamant guardian of Islam, 
a convenient label when the day arrived for the Ottomans to enter the war on the side of Germany. It was also on this historic balcony that a young Turkish heir, besotted with a white Russian dancer who had escaped to Istanbul. After the Bolshevik Revolution, having failed to persuade his family to accept his beloved, had put a pistol to his head and shot himself. The bullet, after traveling through his brain and smashing his skull, had exited behind his left ear and pierced the wall behind him, where it would stay undiscovered for three decades. In its stormy history, the mansion had seen heroes rise and fall, empires soar and collapse, maps expand and shrink, dreams turn into fine dust. But never before had it been rammed by a ship. The vessel's prow had sliced through the wall, demolished a painting by Feral Nisazide, and miraculously stopped just short of the Murano chandelier. Now, in memory of that day, a miniature toy ship dangled from the same chandelier, giving hosts a chance to relate the story, again and again oh, there you are. We thought you'd never come, a voice cried from behind them. It was the businessman's wife. She had spotted Perry as she left the kitchen, after pelting the cook with orders. She wore an emerald green designer cocktail dress with a high collar and open back, cinched at thuist. On her finger a ring of a similar color flashed bright, the stone aspic as a swallow's egg. Her lips were tinted bright crimson and her hair was puled up into a bun so tight it reminded Perry of the goatskin stretched on a darbuka asterisk the traffic, said Perry, as she kissed her hostess on both cheeks. That was the one excuse that won forgiveness no matter how late you were. Once the word was uttered it rendered any other explanation redundant. Perry scanned the faces of her hosts, seeing with relief that it had worked. They looked convinced, although her husband clearly was not but she would have to deal with him later don't you worry, honey, we all know what it's like, said the hostess as he eyed Perry's dress, taking in every rip and stain I didn't have time to change, said Perry. True, she felt naked under the scrutiny, but she also derived a secret satisfaction, at a party full of designer bags and overpriced dresses, from shocking everyone just a tiny bit relax, you are among friends, said the hostess. Would you like to borrow one of my dresses? Perry entertained an image of how, given her record so far this evening she would probably spill tomato sauce on the woman's dress. She shook her head. I'll be fine, thank you for offering well, then, come and eat, you must be starving, the woman said what can I get you to drink? Red. White, asked the businessman so kind, but I must use the ladies first, said Perry. She followed a maid into the depths of the mansion, all the while feeling her husband's eyes burning a hole in her back. Inside the bathroom, Perry locked the door, closed the toilet lid, and sat down. Gulping in a lungful of air, she massaged one temple with her fingertips overcome with exhaustion. She had neither the energy nor the will to go out and face all those people, and yet she knew in a little while she must. If only she could slip away through the toilet window. Carefully, she unwrapped the bandage. The knife had sliced her palm from one end to the other, it wasn't too deep a cut, no stitches had been required. Even so, at the slightest movement, it hurt like hell and started to bleed again. Now, as the wound throbbed with each beat of her heart, she could not help trembling. The gravity of what had happened was finally dawning on her. Her mouth was dry as dust. She wrapped up her hand again. When Perry stood up to wash her face, her eyes widened with surprise. Right across from her was a massive reef aquarium, on which the sink had been set. Inside the glass tank swam dozens of exotic fish, all of them. Shades of yellow and red, the colors of the football team the businessman supported. Everyone knew he was a huge fan, had a private box in Thetham Stadium and enjoyed being photographed with the football players on every occasion. Someday soon he intended to become the president of the club and had been maneuvering actively behind the scenes with this goal in mind. Perry watched the fish in their artificial universe, pristine and protected. On both sides of the sink were silver hammam bowls with repoussé motifs, in which were stacked perfectly rolled, perfectly starched hand towels. All around on the floor, candles burned with tall flickering flames. A blend of aromas caught her nose, sweet and syrupy. Underneath she detected a sharp synthetic smell of detergents, 
an ugly reminder of the tramp's glue. A strong urge to do something unexpected and bold took hold of her. She wanted to smash the aquarium to pieces, shards of glass flying every which way while the fish were sent skidding across the marble floor. Off they would go, flipping their tails, gasping for air, the thrill of escape coursing through their being, they would skate along the corridor, zigzag in and around the feet of the guests, the light from the chandelier reflecting off their scales, they would glide out of the back door, slide from one end of the terrace to the other end, just when they feared death was imminent, plunge into the deep sea, where they would find old friends and relatives that had stayed in the same waters, bored and unchanged. The new arrivals would tell the other fish what it felt like to live in that big mansion above the sea, relinquishing the vastness of the blue in exchange for not having to worry about their next meal. Soon the fugitive fish would be swallowed up by large predators, for how could those used tooth pampered habitat of a rich man's aquarium survive in dangerous waters, all the same, they would not trade a single minute of freedom for all the years in captivity. If only she could find a hammer. Sometimes her own mind scared her. The Breakfast Table Istanbul, 1990's Umit's Imprisonment, like a torch shone into dark corners, exposed to weaknesses and failings the Nalbantaglus had been hiding, as much from themselves as from others. Anyone who observed them would have noticed that whole Umit's absence had opened up in the midst of their lives, but they chose to pretend it wasn't there, that hungry hollow. It was no more than a coincidence that Menser began to drink more heavily, a coincidence took that Selma's cheeks turned an anemic yellow from lack of sleep after nights of praying and lack of proper food after days of fasting. Increasingly, Perry's dreams became more disturbing, her screams louder. She slept with the lights on and kept an amber necklace by her bed, having read that amber drove the demons away. Nothing helped. In her dreams, she saw schools that looked like jails, and wardens who bore a strange resemblance to her mother or father. She found herself covered in maggot sand faces, her hair shaved to the scalp, arrested and imprisoned for a crime she did not know she had committed. From these nightmares she always woke with a galloping heart, and needed several extra seconds to rejoin their old world. Menser had changed. Gone was the man who would down a few with his friends in the warmth of old ballads and lively political debates. He now preferred to drink alone, silence his faithful companion. For a long while his body, strong and sound, showed no signs of deterioration, save for the half-circles under his eyes, dark crescents in a pallid sky. Then came the inevitable. In the mornings Menser would wake up sweating and aching, looking worn out, as though he had been Brea Kingston's in his sleep. He was often confused, nauseous. Trying hard to hide the trembling that invaded his body, he stood distant, buried in silence, or he spoke too much, uncontrollably. The company he worked for decided to give him early retirement when it became obvious he was in no state to work. Without a daily job he spent more time in the house, a change unwelcome to his wife and younger son. Apprehensive, frazzled and easily flurried, he resembled an overstretched empire fighting on two fronts, the old eastern frontier, the battle with his wife, and the newly opened western nun, the battle with Hawken. He was losing on both sides. They quarreled constantly, viciously, father and son, a jumble of male voices, hurtful accusations rising above the breakfast table, like shoals off dead fish floating to the surface after a dynamite explosion. Outwardly, it was over the pettiest issues, a comment about a tasteless shirt or the slurping of tea, yet, inside, the rift went deep. Always, without exception, Selma stood behind her younger son. She was feistier fighting for her offspring than for herself. Fierce and vigorous a falcon defending her chick against the enemy raptor. That made toe against one. An equation that forced Perry to take sides and rush to her father's aid, if only for the sake of balance. However, she didn't really want to win. All she wanted was some sort of ceasefire. A temporary suspension off pain. Soon after, Hawken, who had never really seen the value of a good education, announced he was dropping out of university and had no intention of going back to that useless cowshed. Overnight, to the chagrin of his parents, he ended his student days, 
his mind sealed before it had been opened. They could see in his eyes how much he abhorred his life and those whom he held responsible for its misery. Many days a month Hawken would come home solely to fill his stomach, change his clothes, and catch some sleep. As directionless as a balloon in the wind, he tried his hand at several jobs without success, until he found echoes through a set of friends he called brothers. Mates who had big opinions about America, Israel, Russia, the Middle East, and saw conspiracy theories and secret societies everywhere. They greeted each other by knocking their temples together and splashing out high-sounding words, such as honor, allegiance, and righteousness. In their company, Hawken proved to be a quick learner. The cynicism and pessimism of his new circle suited him. With the help of the brothers he landed a position at an ultranationalist newspaper. Shamelessly careless when it came to grammar and spelling, he nonetheless had a knack for words, adolent for incendiary rhetoric. Under a pseudonym he began to write. Columns that became increasingly shrill and thuggish in their messages. Every week he revealed the traitors of the nation, the rotten apples that, if not taken care of, could putrefy the entire basket, Jews, Armenians, Greeks, Kurds, Alevis, there wasn't a single ethnic group that a Turk could trust other than another Turk. Nationalism, like a bespoke suit, fitted his mood. Nationalism assured him that he had been born into a superior nation, a earthier race, and was destined to do great things, not for himself but for his people. Clad with this identity, he felt strong, principled, invincible. Observing her brother's transformation, Perry would come to understand that nothing swells the ego quite like a cause motivated by the delusion of pure selflessness. You think you have only one son in jail? In this house I'm just as much a prisoner, Hawkins shouted at his father after another breakfast quarrel. Bermuda's lucky, he doesn't have to listen to you haranguing us every day you call your brother lucky, you miserable wretch. Menser shouted back, his voice shaking worse than his hands. Perry listened, her head down, her shoulders stiff. There was something about a family row that resembled an impending avalanche, one wrong word and it threatened to turn into something so huge it brought down everyone let him be. He's just a young man, Selma muttered to her husband an irresponsible young man who lives off his father's money, said Menser oh, you don't want me to eat your food, right? Fine, from now on I want tea. Hawken flung the empty bread basket against the wall, where it bounced like a rubber ball, the crumbs scattering around. Anyway, how ants the bread of an alcoholic? Never before had the word actually been spoken. Unthinkable. Unretractable. Irreparable, to call the head of the house an alcoholic, and diet it was done. Hawken, unable to shoulder the silence that ensued, stormed out. Selma began to cry. In between sobs, her voice rose and fell in a litany of laments. We've been cursed. The whole family. Yes, it's a curse in her elder son's misfortune she saw a punishment and a warning from Allah, she said. As they had paid no heed to the divine message, she ascertained there would be more damnation to come. That's the stupidest thing I've heard, Menser said. Why would God want to destroy the Nalbantaglus? I'm sure he's got better things to do Allah works on us in all sorts of ways. He wishes to teach us, teach you, a lesson and what lesson is that? See the error of your ways, Selma said. Until you get it, none of us will have peace Menser sat tight in his chair. If you really believe what happened to him it is God's doing, and that God needs prisons and torturers to carry out his teachings, there's something wrong with you, woman, or else, damn it there's something wrong with your God Tofbi, Tofbi, asterisk Selma murmured dot to balance out Allah's wrath, Selma went days, sometimes weeks without eating much, content with bread, yogurt, dates, and water. Votive offerings, visceral negotiations with the Almighty. At nights she slept little spending her time doing the only two things that quieted her mind, praying and cleaning. From her bed, she could spot a layer of fine dust on every piece of furniture, she listened to the termites eating away at the wooden cabinets, why couldn't the others hear them? Crushed aspirin, white vinegar, lemon juice, baking soda. She scrubbed, rinsed, 
brushed, lacquered and wiped. In the mornings the family woke up to the smell of detergents. Selma washed her hands so frequently, and with such intensity, that they smelled of antiseptic all the time. The skin was cracked, bleeding in places which increased her fear of contamination and led her to wash them again even harder. To hide the state of her hands, she began to wear black gloves with her hijab and a long, dark, loose coat that reached almost to her heels. Point one evening, as Selma and Perry were returning from the bazaar, Perry looked back and, for a fleeting second, she could not see her mother, Sotheroofly had she blended in with the night. Menser, mortified at his wife's appearance, wished not to be seen with her anymore. He shopped alone, so did she. Her outfit epitomized everything that he had always despised, loathed, and confronted in the Middle East. The benightedness of the religious. The presumption that their ways were the best, only because they had been born into this culture and swallowed unquestioningly whatever they had been taught. How could they be so certain of the superiority of their truths when they knew so little, if anything at all, about other cultures, other philosophies, other ways of thinking, for Selma, Menser's manners embodied all that set her on edge, the condescension in his eyes, the finality in his voice, the righteousness in thetild of his chin. The arrogance of the secular modernists. The pompous and pretentious ease with which they placed themselves outside and above society, looking down on centuries-old traditions. How could they call themselves enlightened when they knew so little, if anything at all, about their own culture, their own faith? rigid with the dread of having to converse, husband and wife slipped past each other, onto Ushing. What they lacked in love, they made up for in resentment. Meanwhile, Perry found solace in literature. Short stories, novels, poems plays, she devoured whatever she could lay her hands on at the limited library at school. When there was nothing else to be found, she read encyclopedias. Devouring everything from aardvark to zombie, she came to know about things that, though of no current use in her life, might someday come in handy, she hoped. But even if they were never to have a function, she would still keep reading, propelled by her hunger for learning. Books were liberating, full of life. She preferred being in storyland tobing in her motherland. Refusing to leave her room on weekends munching on apples and sunflower seeds, she finished one borrowed novel after another. She discovered that intelligence, like a muscle, needed to be exercised with increasing levels of stress, if it were to grow to its full potential. Unsatisfied with the rote learning at school, she developed verbal and visual methods of her own to store information, names of plants in Latin, lines of poems in English, the dates of wars, peace treaties, and more wars, of which there were far too many in Ottoman history. She was determined to excel in every subject, from literature to maths, from physics to chemistry. She imagined different subjects as tropical birds kept in separate cages side by side. What would happen if she cut holes in the wire mesh and the birds could fly into the next cage and then the next? Shell on to see maths keeping company with literature, physics with philosophy. Who had decided they could not mingle, anyway? Perry understood that her obsession with studying kept her apart from her peers and earned her their envy and animosity. It suited her just fine. Like Eel Nal Bontaglues, she had a natural proclivity for loneliness. She didn't mind that the other children called her teacher's pet, she didn't mind that she wasn't invited to popular girls' birthday parties or asked out to films by popular boys. That life was about enlightenment or ideals or love that made sense to her. But fun, that was never her thing. Like every outcast she would soon discover that she was not alone. In every class there were a few who, for a variety of reasons, remained out off sync with everyone else. They would recognize each other immediately. It took one untouchable to know another, a Kurdish boy ridiculed for his accent, a girl with facial hair, another girl in a lower class who could not control her bladder when she got nervous in exams, a boy whose mother was rumored to be a wanton woman. With them she became good friends. But her true companions were always books. Imagination was her home, her homeland, her refuge, her exile. Hence she read and studied, 
and finished at the top of her class, term after term. Whenever her self-confidence needed a boost, she ran to her father. And Menser always gave the same counsel, education, my soul. Education will save us. You're the pride of our joyless family, but I want you to be educated in the West. Plenty of good schools in Europe but you must go to Oxford. You'll fill your head with knowledge and then you'll come back. Only young people like you can change the fate of this tired old country back in his youth Menser had met a student from Oxford, a backpacker a pale-skinned hippie with whom he had felt an instant rapport. The man was planning to travel through Turkey all alone on his bike. He had boasted that he kept all his money inside his sock to thwart pickpockets and hotel thieves. Worried that something might happen to this naive foreigner Menser had insisted on accompanying him. The two of them had traversed the Anatolian Peninsula, after which the fair-haired Brit had crossed into Iran. What happened to him Menser did not know. But he had never forgotten his own bafflement at seeing his country through the eyes of Osterner. It was the first time he had realized that what was ordinary to him was not necessarily so to outsiders. It was the first time he had realized there was an outside world. Now he wanted his daughter to be educated there. It was his most fervent wish. Perry, and hundreds of youngsters like Perry, would become an educated, idealistic, forward-thinking graduate who would rescue this country from its backwardness. Perry understood and accepted that some daughters were born with Amos Zion, to fulfill their father's dreams. In doing so, they would also bear deeming their fatherland. The tango with Israel Istanbul, 1990s the summer Perry turned 11 years old, her mother, fulfilling a long-awaited dream, went on pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia. Her elder brother still in prison, her other brother squatting in God knows whose house, she and her father were left in charge at home. They prepared their own food, coffee and chips for lunch, coughed and spaghetti for supper, washed the dishes, simply rinsed, and watched any TV program they fancied. It was like being on holiday, except better. On the day of the local bazaar, Perry woke up, feeling queasy. She held her stomach with a sneaking feeling that all that coughed and spaghetti had finally got to her. She would have to remind her father to change the menu. But Azure Prize awaited her in the bathroom, stains on her underwear. Too dark and diet she knew it was blood. Her mother had warned her this would happen and, when it did, she would have to be all the more careful with boys. Don't let them touch you. It was too soon. At school, she had eavesdropped on older girls complaining about it, my aunt is back, they would say airily could you check my back, they would ask each other, hurrying their steps. In her classroom, there was one girl who claimed she had had her period, though everyone knew it was a lie. That left Perry as the first among her peers. She had grown too fast this past year, no matter how much she tried to hide it. She had been told enough times that she was pretty to understand this was what people thought of her. Her own perception of herself was acutely different. How she wished she had hair black as night instead of a mousy light brown, instead of her newly beginning curves, a confident flatness. She would have loved to have been born as the third son of the Nalbantaglus. Wouldn't life be easier had she been a boy, she found a clean old bedsheet, cut it into strips. If she used it sparingly wisely, she would not have to say anything to her mother. She could wash, dry and reuse them, the way she knew many women did in this country. That way, she could conceal the truth until she was about 14, the age she regarded as fitting for her first period. God had made a mistake in his divine calculation. She was determined to correct it. Point two weeks later Selma returned, sunburned, and thinner. She plopped down on the sofa and began to relate her journey to Mecca, her words galloping along as her porcelain horses would have done, had they a breath of life in them last year, a stampede inside a pedestrian tunnel in the holy city kill at more than a thousand pilgrims. Now the Saudis are cautious, she explained but they can't prevent diseases. I got so sick I thought I was going to die. Right then and there. Oh, I'm glad you didn't, Menser said. Good to have you back thank Allah, I'm home, 
Selma said with a sigh. If I hadn't made it, I'd have been buried in Medina, close to the Prophet, peace be upon him the cemeteries in Istanbul have a better view, Menser quipped. We've a fresh sea air. Buried in Medina, you'd have been mulch for a date palm. In Istanbul, you can fertilize mastic, linden, maple. Jasmine would be great. You'd be bathed in perfume all year round. Selma shrank away from her husband's words as if they were hot cinders spat sizzling from a fire. Worried that they might lock horns again, Perry butted in, What's in your suitcase, Mum? Did you bring us anything? I brought you the whole of Mecca, came the answer. Perry and Menser perked up, their faces beaming, two expectant kids. Point one by one packages were unwrapped, dates, honey, Miswak, Cologne's prayer mats, musk, rosaries, scarves and zamzam in tiny bottles how do you know this is sacred water, did anyone authenticate it? Menser inquired, shaking a bottle. They might as well have sold you tap water at which Selma grabbed the bottle, opened it and drained it in one's wallow. This is pure zamzam but your mind is filthy. Fine. Menser shrugged dot pointing at a box, Perry asked. What's that, mum? That turned out to be a mosque-shaped bronze wall clock, 20 times 18 inches, with a swinging pendulum and minarets on both sides. Selma explained it could be programmed to show prayer times in a thousand cities. Worldwide. Then she hung it up on a nail in the living room, in the Kibla direction, across from the portrait of a Tatark. I'm not having a mosque under my roof, said Menser. Oh, really? But I have to live with an infidel under mine, reposted Selma well, right now half of my sins are yours. If you hadn't bought that thing, I'd have never blasphemed. Take it down. I won't, Selma shouted. I chose it, paid for it, carried it all the way from the Holy Land. I got sick there, almost died. I'm a haji, show me some respect. It was the first time Perry heard her mother yell at her father. Coming from a woman whose main rebellion for years had been either stoical silence or barbed words at low decibels, it sounded like an explosion. The wall clock stayed where it was, albeit muted, a concession that made neither party happy. During the rest of the day, Menser was locked in a deep sulk. The same evening there was a power cut that went on for hours. Menser took his place at the Reiki table earlier than usual, between a tatterk and the prayer clock, his pale face cast in shadows by a lit candle, he said he was feeling unwell. Bringing his hand to his heart, as if to salute an invisible being, he tilted his head to one side and collapsed. It was a heart attack. For as long as she lived, Perry would never forget how the night grew darker by the minute. As she observed with horror, her father slumped over like a lifeless mannequin his forehead hitting the table, he was picked up by neighbors, who had come when they heard Selma's cries, and carried tough sofa. Then, as he was placed on a stretcher, tucked into an ambulance rushed into the A&E department and pushed into an operating theater with machines beeping on all sides, the only thing she could think of, over and over, was whether it was a punishment from God. The question was so intimidating that it could not be expressed aloud, it had to be swallowed down. She would have liked to ask her mother, weeping by her side, but was terrified of the answer Selma might provide. Was this the way of Allah? First, he allowed you to utter profanities and joke without inhibition. Next, he made you pay the price. It was almost as if he waited for you to sin so that he could smack you with his wrath. Was the way of God one of camouflage, a trick to disguise calculated revenge? Another persistent thought gnawed away at her. Deep down in her mind Perry was convinced that her father's heart attack was, through some circuitous chain of causation in the universe, instigated by her period. We had she bled so early and while her mother was away. It was wrong of her to try to become the woman of the house. Wrong also because, as she no reckoned, the faster she grew, the sooner her father might die. In the waiting room at the hospital, Perry and Selma sat on the worn out sofa. A shaft of moonlight pierced through the windows, only to be engulfed by the intrusive glare of the fluorescent lamps. The TV was on though silent. On the screen, 
a woman in a red sequin dress turned through heel of fortune and was disappointed to see it land on bankrupt. The caretaker on duty, a hefty man with a bushy mustache and the only person watching the program, laughed gleefully I'll go and pray, Selma said may I come with you. Selma stared at her daughter, half expecting this question. That'd be good, actually. Allah listens to children's prayers Perry nodded, as a dutiful daughter should. Save for a few invocations learned by rote at school, she had never performed the Salah, given her wish to side with her father in all matters related to faith. Menser, unlike his wife, kept his prayers succinct and non-ceremonial. He rarely used the word Allah, preferring the more secular-sounding Tanri. Now Perry was ready to do things her mother's way. She would do anything to save her father's life, even betray him. Inside the lavatory they performed their ablutions, rinsing their mouths washing their faces, hands, feet. The water was chilly but Perry did not complain, regarding the ritual as a preamble to a conversation with God. There were no prayer rooms in this wing of the hospital and they used a corner of the waiting room instead, the TV still on, the red sequin dressed woman still determined to win. Having no prayer rugs, they spread their cardigans on the floor. Whatever her mother did, Perry imitated, like an echo. Thus, as Selma crossed her hands over her chest, so did Perry. Selma bent down, stood up, and then prostrated herself, her forehead touching the ground, so did Perry. There was however, one vital difference. Her mother's lips were constantly moving whereas Perry's were still. It occurred to her that this might not sit well with God. A silent prayer was tantamount to an envelope with nothing inside. Since no one, not even the Creator, would care to receive such an envelope she figured out she would have to say something. And this, after some deliberation, was what the child uttered Dear Allah Mother says you watch me all the time, which is nice, thank you, it's also a bit spooky because sometimes I want to be alone. Mother says you hear everything, even when it talk to myself. Even the thoughts inside my head. You also watch all that happens. Can you see the baby in the mist? No one notices it but me, though I am sure you do too. Anyway, I was thinking, our eyes are small and it takes us about a second to blink. Now, your eyes must be huge, so it must take you at least an hour to shut your eyelids and maybe in that time you can't gaze at my father. When I get cross at someone, dad tells me, you are not a little child. You can forgive if you are angry with my father, please forgive him and make him well again. He is a good man. From now on, please can you blink every time my father sins, I promise I'll start praying again. I'll pray every night for the rest of my life. Ammon Perry, perched on her cardigan, saw her mother turn her head right and left, and rub her hands over her face, thus ending the prayer, all of which she imitated sealing her confidential letter. The next morning Menser was propped up in bed with pillows, teasing his visitors, and a few days later he was out of hospital with a fat bill and a battery-operated pacemaker in his heart. He was advised to give up drink and again to stay away from stress, as if stress were an obnoxious relative one could simply stop inviting to dinner. In any case, Menser would not listen. Having danced a tango with Israel, the angel of death, he claimed he had nothing to be afraid of any more. This, too, would penetrate Perry's dreams, the ghostly sight of her father dancing a disjointed jig with a skeleton, that turned out to be his own.